Hello and welcome to the March or Die show today. Very glad to have you joining me. This is a very special episode of the March or Die show. I'm here in the Samaritan's Purse podcast studio. There are a few different studios, but we're in the podcast studio today with my guest, Edward Graham, who I will introduce in just a moment, but excited to share this conversation with you. Uh, Our team from the Mighty Oaks Foundation has traveled here to North Carolina, spent a few days learning and hopefully growing and We'll see what we learn. We, we, we try to learn. We just don't always do a great job, but we'll take a lot of this back with us and continue to do ministry, and we're excited for the opportunity to do that. But while we were here, I uh, asked Edward if we could sit down and talk and wanted to share this conversation with you. So I'm excited to share this conversation with you in just a moment. Hello and welcome back. Great to have you again joining the March or Die show today. If you are not yet subscribed to the podcast, maybe you're listening on the radio or you're listening to the podcast but not yet subscribed, please take some time to subscribe to the podcast. There are several places that you can find that. The easiest one is to just go to my website with my name, jeremystallnucker.com, jeremystallnucker.com. People always ask me, why do you have a website with your name on it? Because that's the only thing I can remember. But from there, you can find uh, a link to the Mighty Oaks Foundation website, mightyoaksprograms.org. You can find that there, all the social media stuff, the blog that I write on weekly, other uh, podcasts I'm involved in. You can find all of that on jeremystonlicker.com. So please check that out. And thank you for joining me. Today, my guest is Edward Graham. Edward is the COO of Samaritan's Purse, uh, retired or former Army. Mm-hmm. And um, my first question is going to be right at, at that. Why in the world the Army and not the Marine Corps? I'm sure there was some <laughs> failing in your life that led you to that. But uh, very graciously giving us time today. And we're going to talk about Samaritan's Purse, talk about his life, and, and uh, just so many other great things. But uh, very glad to have you all joining us. Edward, thank you so yeah. much. Really appreciate it. No, it's an honor to be on your podcast. Thanks for having me. So let's start right there. Yeah. What would happen that you... <laughs> made such a horrible horrible <laughs> life to say hey, i love my marines reason being my grandfather uh not billy graham but ned cunningham people always assume i just had one grandfather but sure. i had two <laughs> yeah, shocking yeah, two. and um we called him pop ned cunningham we called pop he was a marine in world war ii and fought on bloody uh tarawa terrible tarawa yeah. and um and then he was shot on saipan and so I always loved the Marine Corps. I actually grew up wanting to be uh, a Marine. I remember as a kid, I even had a little trident hat to wear around when we'd play war. Yeah. Um, but I had two posters on my wall. I had an Army Ranger poster sure. and I had a West Point poster. Yeah. And so I knew what the Naval Academy was, but I didn't want to ride around on ships. And, you know, you know, sure. I was told to me, you're not guaranteed to go there and be in the Marine yeah, Corps. That's right. So we ask, I'm the kid that lived his dream, being an Army Ranger yeah. and going to West Point. Yeah, that's awesome. Um your your family history and family story is very unique, and, and I would like to get into that as we continue our conversation. But before that, and I think this is the important starting point, mm-hmm. is your own faith journey. Mm-hmm. And growing up around, you know, we're on the campus here, Samaritan's Purse, and around uh, the Graham family, and with the, the Billy Graham name, I would imagine sometimes looming overhead – there still comes a point, this is important for everyone to understand, that you have to make your own decision for Christ. The faith journey has to be your own. Yeah. Um, can you tell us that story, how you came to Christ, and, and really how God led you to the place where you are now? Yeah, there's um, it's it's a story, and it takes time, obviously, yeah. but just because my last name's Graham doesn't mean I'm going right. to heaven as right. a Christian. Right. Um, I had to make that decision as a moment. So when I was five years old, I was actually at a, at a Billy Graham crusade in California. Mm. My dad had taken the whole family out there. And we went to Knoxbury Farm that, yeah. that day, and we were yeah. playing, and we had these little toy tanks that we were playing Army with. Uh, we might have been playing Marine tanks. I don't know. Uh, I mean, you don't have <laughs> Army. Marine. You got rid of your tanks. We got uh, rid of them, but we used to have them. <laughs> <laughs> but we were playing, and my brothers were teasing me that I was going to hell because I wasn't a Christian. I guess that's what Graham's tease about. And so I, I got mad. I went to my mom. I was like, hey, tell them I'm wrong. And, you know, yeah. wrong I'm not going to hell. And my mom's yeah. like, no, you are going to hell. And I was oh. like, whoa, mom. <laughs> yeah. That's a pretty aggressive yeah, family. Yeah, <laughs> so, but my mom's the one that shared Christ with right. me in the story of salvation. So I accepted Christ at five years old in a hotel room with my mother. Yeah, wow. And even though we were at the Billy Graham crusade, yeah. it wasn't there. But later in life, when I was in high school, I learned um, more about quiet time and having that personal relationship with Christ and, and my youth group. But it wasn't until West Point, uh, really in my sophomore and junior year, I really messed up. Hmm. And some friends called me out. For not living for the Lord, uh, some friends at West Point, 
And I think at that point I made my it became my own faith, not my yeah. family's, yeah. not because I was a gram yeah. or that's what was expected, yeah. but I had to make that faith my own. And I made a decision there to turn from some of the areas I was walking down. I had the right accountability there with the group of friends. Um, one of those guys is now blind, lost his eyes in Mosul to a suicide bomber. We always called him the Oak. Hmm. And the reason why we called hmm. him the Oak is because he was unshakable. Like yeah. The Mighty Oak Foundation. Yeah. He was a... Uh, he couldn't be moved in his faith at, uh, at West Point, neither could after he lost his eyes. Yeah. Um, but he's the one that called me out and just said, hey, God told me to speak to you. You're not living for the Lord. And I was at the, my lowest low. Mm. And it was through that fellowship with them and that discipleship and those friendships that I got my walk on back with the Lord. I met my wife yeah. uh, shortly after, and I realized I was like, that's what I want, a mm. woman like that. Yeah. And, uh, and God blessed me with that. But... Yeah, it's really your faith has to become your own, not your family's, yeah. not your parents. Yeah, that's right. When you were in, in the army, and you know, throughout your time in the army, but certainly in combat operations and the things that you had to deal with and and see and process. I was a Christian when I went to the Marine Corps, and so maybe this a similar perspective. But it, it's a very different situation to be a Christian, to have a settled faith, and to work through everything that happens in a combat environment mm-hmm. than it is without Christ. Yeah. Was there an opportunity for you to see the contrast in your own life, or did you have to work through some of that? As a Christian, I look at the world different. I look at these events different. I'm processing this differently. How was your faith, or how did your faith impact your time in in those environments? Yeah, you know, I people always ask me, did you? Ever, I hear it all the time, actually, especially in ministry. Did you struggle with PTSD? Yeah. And I always tell people, I didn't struggle with PTSD. I, maybe we all had PTS, sure. meaning a yep. certain sounds, smells. Yeah. Um, but I think because of my faith, I learned to surrender. Mm. Um, and that I was going to be a part of things and see things that were bigger than me. Then I had to put the foot across. But I already surrendered my life to the yeah. Lord. I surrender it all. Knowing that He's called me, like, and I felt the calling. As I said before, I'm the kid that lived his dream. Yeah. Yeah. And I got to be part of the 75th Ranger Regiment for yeah. most of my career and lead yeah. men in combat. And as most of us know, there's not, not a worse feeling than losing someone yeah. under your command right. doing exactly what you told them to do. That's right. And you always kind of second guess or doubt yourself and mm-hmm. decisions made. We do that anyways because we're their toughest critics yeah, usually. sure. And so that will eat you alive, I think, yeah. if you focus and you – you look at those aspects of those images that you see in your life. So in my faith, I'd always have to tell people, because I made that decision to have that faith my own at West Point, I never went through combat without it. Yep. So I didn't have those kind of struggles, the things I saw, the things I was a part of. I also put it in a biblical worldview. I mean, when I was in Iraq, so most of my time was in Afghanistan. I did two deployments to Iraq, and to be in Mosul— and sitting in old Mosul, mm-hmm. and then outside yeah. the gates of there is Nineveh. Yeah. And I'm sitting yeah. in Nineveh, and like yeah. biblical scriptures are coming. This is where scripture happened. Yeah. And, and, and so for me, I was always looking through that kind of perspective and lens, and maybe that helped me. Um, I'm also the guy that grew up on, now this doesn't have much to do with my face, but I grew up on, a, on John Wayne movies. Mm-hmm. And I'm the kid that loved America. and. Yeah. You remember the old commercials, Be All You Can Be for yeah. the Army, but yeah. the Marine recruiting commercials, like as a kid, sign me up. Right. The new recruiting commercials don't resonate with me, yeah. but it's a different yeah. generation. Sure. Um, but that's not what I got focused on. But between my faith and I think my love for this country, I'm a very, I'm, I'm believing, there's some churches that are speaking out against patriotism. Yeah. I think that's wrong. I think yeah. we can have a love for our country. Um, we are blessed to live here. And I always say deployments were an appreciation tour for America, what God's given us. Yeah. God's entrusted us something very special here to us and gave us a, an opportunity to share the gospel around the world out of this country. Now we're failing, the church is failing, yeah. but my military career allowed me to see that as a whole. It made me love this country even more, yeah. the opportunity that God's yeah. given me. And I think because of what I learned in combat only shaped and molded me for what I'm doing now. So I, my faith was everything in my yep. career, and it's what shaped and molded me to where I am yeah, now. That's good. You talk about living the dream. I, I've, I've talked about that often. For me, growing up in a pastor's home, I told my dad when I was 14 I wanted to be a Marine. Yeah. He said, God cannot possibly want you to be a Marine. It's got to be something <laughs> else. But made sure I went to college, and so I was commissioned. And to me, deploying to Kuwait and then into Iraq really was the fulfillment of a dream. Mm-hmm. It was what I pointed my whole life toward. 
but then the lessons I learned personally, and I think being confronted with the reality of, of that, uh-huh. of people dying, of the uncertainty of life. I remember standing uh, on a dirt road after a firefight in Iraq as a Christian. I'd grown up as a Christian. I accepted Christ when I was young. But really for the first time, fully grasping, in that moment at least, the sovereignty of God. Mm -hmm. That the enemy doesn't care who I am or where I came from or what my last name is or who my parents were. Doesn't care. I do what I can do. I control what I can control. But ultimately, God is sovereign over this. And there was such a peace that came with that in that Mm -hmm. moment, which is is weird. Yeah. Now, some of my nastiest firefights, as a matter of fact, you're... Uh, Chief Operating Officer Ian Hunter and I served yeah. together, and we yeah. were in some ne- like r- ridiculous firefights in Afghanistan uh, with his brother as well. They were in the same platoon. I mean, we're, we're talking about firefights where like hundreds mm. were were mm-hmm. killed. And when all that chaos, and I was a fires guy at the time, I came into the into the Ranger Regiment actually as a field artillery officer. And when yeah. I switched over to the infantry at that time, I was the fires guy controlling all the the fast movers and the C one thirty and the mortars, and I loved it. Yeah, but so much chaos around you yeah. in the air and, and like one one firefight alone we had two ac-130 gunships circling at the same time both shooting that's incredible and so if, if you know that they can prosecute two targets at the same time so that's four targets going on that we're shooting incredible. that's how many people are down between us and when it was all and i had a10s coming in under strafing underneath all that and when it was all said and done you take your headset off and you're like what just happened um how did we all we all came out alive mm-hmm. and not a scratch mm. And that's God, yep. you know, working and organ. But I realized that whole time and all that chaos, yep. He was in control. But I can remember when it first started, and we came in, and the and the guns started flaring on the uh, on the um, MH forty sevens. The mini guns started going on a hot infill, and you know it's going to be a crazy night. Um, I just I'd say a quick prayer. I was like, yeah. Lord, it's your night. That's good. And at yep. the end of the night, I was like, To God be the glory. So yeah. we get back on the helicopter. But then a similar experience, my first time a guy died under my command, and his name was Jason Fingar, and mm-hmm. he loved the Lord. And he prayed for his platoon every time he yeah. went out, and he always led his platoon in prayer. Yeah. And you're like, why Jason Fingar, Lord? And I remember when his body's flying away in the helicopter, and I'm sitting there in that crater, and I'm praying for his mother and father that are about to get the worst news, because I've done that knock yeah. at the door before. Yeah. I started praying for that notification officer, the chaplain that was going to be find the right chaplain to go. Yeah. Like Lord paved this way. This was this allowed to happen. I don't know your reasons why, but I trust your sovereignty. Right. So just like the Lord was in control of that firefight when no one got scratched, God was just as controlled then. It hurt me, it pained me, but I accepted by faith that He's still the Lord and, right. and He still sits on that throne. Yeah. Why Jason Fingar? I don't know. To this day. I know some guys came to Christ later mm. because of Jason Fingar. That was the reason. Okay. Sure. But I still miss Jason Fingar. Yeah, of course. Yeah, and trusting God through all of that is, again, I think you have to be confronted with the reality of life and death. And and I can only speak for me, but as an infantry officer, I felt almost invincible and that I could control just about anything. I could get on the radio and get F-18s on station. We could control fires. I'm just as guilty. <laughs> well forward. And then you have a moment like that where you realize, like, yeah, I'm not in control of anything. You know, all those firefights I had to talk about, like, I had three... Uh, Ranger Point, no one died in my command. We had right. some of the nastiest firefights I've ever been to. Ian and I had some friends that were hurt and maimed for their life. Um, I was there for, with one of them with Ian, with your COO, and I uh, was a good friend of ours. And those opportunities happen, but you kind of get a little cocky. Yep. Like, they, yep. I can do yep. this. Like, I can control. It's me. I'm the reason this is. <laughs> and, right. And God fixed that quick. Sure. And I realized, no, I've never been in control. That goes back to the surrender piece, and right. you got to give it all to the Lord. And that's even true in ministry now. Every now I got to remember, like, I'm not needed here. God doesn't need me. Yeah, um, He wants me. God uses me. That's right. Yeah, but He doesn't need me. When you transitioned out of the Rangers, you left the Army and came to work at Samaritan's Purse. Obviously, a huge transition. Yeah. And uh, a lot of the folks, in fact, I say this a lot, and I believe this that. Thousands of men and women have attended our programs at Mighty Oaks Foundation. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of them will say it's because of trauma, either combat trauma or some of the trauma in their life. That's there. That's present. But I've found just observing that most of what people are dealing with is is the problem of transition. They're leaving a life that they understand, uh, understand they identify with. Mm-hmm. That's, that's where their identity is. They find themselves in a different situation, maybe a good job, maybe yeah. a good family. 
this was me. I left the Marine Corps. A month later, I was working on a church staff, uh-huh. and it took me about two months before the bottom fell out. I almost got fired from my first church job because I was just a, I was just a wreck, uh-huh. and it was, it was an identity issue. Did you struggle with any of that? And if so, how did you deal with it? If not, what did you have in place that carried you through? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and you were spot on when you talk about identity. Mm-hmm. If you would have asked me four years ago, Edward, what are you? I would have looked at you and be like, right. you're an idiot. Like, my scroll tells you I'm an Army Ranger. My yeah. tambourine says I'm an Army Ranger. And I'm that's what not what I was, though. Mm. I was bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. Yeah. I'm his son. That was always my identity. And I lived my faith in my career. Like, guys, yeah. I call it earn the knock at the door. Yeah. Like, you know, I can't preach from the formation in front of the guys. I can't a little bit. Yeah. Um, but if but, they come to you. Hey, sir, can I? Yeah. My wife's leaving me. Can we talk? Yeah. All right, buddy. Yeah. Hey, sir, what? Why do you have yeah. hope? Yeah. And so I, those are conversations I could do. It, but when I left, I did struggle, and it was my decision. I left at 16 years, not the best career decision. <laughs> my dream job was looked like it was going to be offered to me to command the unit that I always wanted to command, yeah. and to walk away from that was extremely difficult. And for the first six months here, I really struggled. Um, I had to drive off to our location down to to North Wilkesboro, where you've been to, but that's like a 40 minute drive. Right. Every time I would drive down there, I felt like I was supposed to be going in for the morning to get ready for PT with the yeah, guys, sure. and I, I missed that camaraderie. I missed those people. Yep. I missed that mission and that drive. I love what I was doing here. Mm-hmm. I love the people here, but for it's different. the Marine Corps does it well too with yeah. Esprit de Corps. Yeah, it's different. But I realized the Army, the Ranger Regiment, had beat into me yep. what they wanted and who they said I was. That's right. And so we all struggle with that, and we all get out, whether – and this is where I really relate to those that – because we have Operation Hill, our Patriots, our ministry in Alaska for wounded veterans and their spouses. A lot of these guys woke up in a bed, and that decision was made for them. Right. And they never got closure. And now I understand if I made a decision to get out and I struggled, now I really know why they struggled. Mm. Their identity was ripped from them, and they had no choice or say in the matter. And so I have a heart and I think a, not just sympathy, but an understanding and a passion for those that are struggling when they get out. It's very real. And I don't care if you spend any time in the military, it's going to be a struggle. Yeah. And if you made it a career, you're definitely going to struggle. Yeah. It, it's an interesting process because the military needs to tear a young person down, to strip their identity away, mm-hmm. and to infuse them with this belief, at least, this ethos that... You are now a warrior. There is nothing that you cannot yeah. do. And when we point you, you can take yeah, that hill. It doesn't right. matter how many enemies And soldiers the Marines there. do it very well. Marines do a great <laughs> job. And that's really helpful in a combat environment. But when you transition out of that, if you carry that with you, yeah. and I carried it with me, and it was, it took some people that I care about confronting me uh, very directly to, to move yeah. me past that. You asked how I got through it. I don't, no one really confronted with me. I shared my struggles yeah. with people. Not that I'm some Philly guy. Yeah. I don't think any of us That's are. That's the better way, though. Yeah. <laughs> to be but confronted. I, I've been confronted. Like I told yeah. you, my friend at West Point confronted yeah. me. Um, but I, I had some even friends here that weren't in the military, and I was like, yeah, I've, I'm struggling with this. Yeah. And so people, I asked people to pray for me. That's good. And prayer, but I made that decision to get out through fasting. I think a lot of people forget, like, I've been praying, I've been praying, but fasting mm-hmm. is a lost yeah. um, practice in yeah. our faith, and a lot of people forget to do that. And trust me, I love eating. I love food. Um, <laughs> we just had lunch. Yes. Yeah. I, <laughs> and, I, I, and clearly, I've got that reservist-looking body now. But the, uh, I th- you know, I had to fast about it, and so that helped me with my decision. But my wife struggled. She comes from a huge military mm-hmm. family, and she loved the Ranger Regiment. My my. The Lord gave me a Spartan wife, yeah, and she struggled with getting out. And so I even had to ask her. I was like, "Honey, I need help. Mm. I need you to help me and reinforce me in this decision." When we're, because I made the decision to get out in a month, um, and I got out in a really in about three months. I got out of the army. And as you know, if you've been in sixteen years, it should take a little yeah, longer. I left long. everything yeah. there—the VA, yeah. all that—I just walked yeah. away from. Yeah, I figured God will figure out retirement. Yeah, yeah, that's funny. I. I was not in for 16 years. I was in for um, eight years. Uh. But when I left, I just felt like I needed to walk away from everything, yeah. and I left it all. I, I regret some of that. Yeah. <laughs> There's probably a better way. You but... know what? But I understand that, too, because I, I, I did drill for a while. Like I re- They yeah. let me retiring at 20 as a reservist. I hated it. Yeah. Because to go back, I feel like I was yeah. playing or pretending, and not yeah. the same thing as the reserve. Sure. Just for me, I, w- I just wanted to rip the scab off and go just away. Just move forward. Just yeah. move on. Just yeah. 
March or die. Yeah, sure, <laughs> sure. Yeah, just March. Um, man, there's so much to be learned from that. And we were talking about this a little while ago. I think you bring a different perspective into even ministry mm-hmm. coming from that military environment. It, it, again, going kind of back to your upbringing, you, you were raised in a very unique environment. I think you would acknowledge that. Certainly mm-hmm. anyone looking at you would say that's pretty unique, right? Yeah. Um, when I got off the uh, airplane in, in Charlotte and got onto the road, I was getting onto the Billy Graham Parkway, yeah. right? So th- this is something that you lived under that most people don't understand maybe or, or recognize. And I would imagine there was some tension there. I, I don't know that. Um, depending on how people look at your grandfather and your father, they mm-hmm. love you or they hate you or whatever. Yeah. Um, but I would imagine there's some great lessons to be learned too. What are some of the things you learned from your granddad and, yeah. and your dad? So, you know, I always tell people it opens doors and it closes doors. Sure. Yeah, and you sure. always, this was a small town, Boone was. And so I was telling you earlier that if I got in trouble, my parents, yeah. they found out real quick. <laughs> right. Um, but my grandfather, what I loved about him, what you saw on TV mm. and what you heard on the radio is no different when you got in real life. There mm. wasn't two different Billy Grahams. Yeah. And he was a very loving and gracious grandfather. Now, he had a bunch of grandkids. He wasn't home that much. He traveled the world yeah. speaking. But yeah. when he was home, he tried to spend time with us. Um, but I remember watching the news one time. And this is when, like, cable news first came out. Sure. And we're watching some stuff on some political, uh, some election stuff. This was during the Clinton uh, election. And my grandfather had his Bible out. And he looked at me and goes, Edward... I don't understand every word of it, but I accept by faith that every word's true. Yeah. And I was a young kid, you know, sure. I'm like, I kind of looked at him, I was like, okay, you know, thanks. We call him Daddy Bill. Thanks, Daddy Bill. But as I got older and I started talking about making my faith my own, I realized the power in those words as I started reading and hungered for the gospel. Yeah. I don't understand a lot of this word. Right. But I accept every word of it to be true. If it's not true, if one piece is false, it all crumbles. The whole thing falls apart. The whole thing yeah. falls apart. And I love that part about building your house on the sand or on the rock. Mm-hmm. You know, the rock is Jesus Christ. Yeah. And I accept by faith every word he said is true. And everything that led up to the prophecy of Jesus Christ is true. And everything that's living today out of Revelations is yeah. true. And I, yeah. um, that's the greatest lesson or legacy. Like I said, he couldn't give me his faith. He couldn't make me right. a Christian. Right. It's not a birthright. And... Teaching me that. There's another story my brother Roy tells real well. My grandfather loved root beer. He sip, he, he would sip on root beer all the time. But he came out of his, his study one time, and he had Bibles everywhere. Sure. He had Bibles in his study. He had <laughs> Bibles in the living room. They're always open. And he'd walk down the hall, the hall and read a little bit from the Bible in the hallway, and then he would go into the kitchen and read. He opened up a root beer, read a little bit more, and when he was walking away, my brother Roy goes, Daddy Bill, you couldn't have possibly gotten anything out of that 15 seconds of reading. And I think he'd been waiting for this moment his whole life. He took a sip of that root beer and he looked at Roy and goes, I sip on the gospel all day long. Yeah. And it's so true. You don't, yes, we need to take time to read and have our quiet times and really dedicate it. But especially with technology now, with our phone, we have opportunity to read the yeah. gospel all day long. Yeah. And you did devotions with us this morning and uh, here at Samaritan's Purse that we do every morning. And, you know, I was getting something out of that this morning. I was marking stuff on my phone. Um, like I've never read it that way. Right. And I was like, I've never. That's a that's a good right. point in what he shared today, and so I learned that from my grandfather. That's Even good. he sipped on the word. And this is a man that had most of it memorized. Yeah. And so those are two lessons I look back. Um, you know, from my grandfather. Now, from my my dad and watching him always. Um, dad is one of the most gracious men, and this shocks a lot of people as, as they work for dad. But I came to the Samaritan's Purse when I did to learn about grace. And from my dad, my dad is a very forgiving, loving, and a trusting person. Yeah. Um, but even when you're wrong, he takes a biblical approach about correction and mm-hmm. second chances mm-hmm. and redemption. Yeah. And um, my dad is a product of redemption and second chances. And so he knows it well. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to learn from him. So those are the best things, a legacy. Yeah. It is a weird family. We had some neat opportunities. We met some very interesting people at right. the time. Right. I realize it is different. But like my mom says, I put my jeans on just sure. like everyone yeah. did in the what morning. What family's not different? Yeah. And my right. mom would beat the fire out of me if I ever thought different. Um, <laughs> I was a very disciplined family, you know, for my mom. <laughs> but my mom helped. Raise. Dad was gone a lot too. And yeah. so my mom was very important in my upbringing. Yeah. 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 Um, Man, there's a lot there I, I could dig into, but <laughs> spankings. Yeah, yeah. There's a, well, you know, it's funny to hear your you talk about your mom 
saying, yeah, you, you will go to hell if you don't uh, accept yeah. Christ, right? And like just holding you to that standard, I think, is... Well, my dad... What, what a great legacy, though, right? My dad's a product of a strong woman. There never would have been a Billy Graham if there was not Ruth Graham, my yeah. grandmother. She was born in China to missionary family. She went to school in Pyongyang, which is now North Korea. Yeah. They met at Wheaton. But she was a strong and just a biblical, and yeah. she had scripture. She knew more of the Bible than my grandfather. Yeah. And my mom's much the same way. And... Um, but also they were the ones that were the disciplinarians because yeah. the men in their lives were traveling all the time. Yeah. So uh, my mom's a tough lady. Yeah. <laughs> She'd have been a good Marine. <laughs> she has some of that Marine in her. Mm. Um, let's talk about Samaritan's Purse for a minute. We've been here for a couple of days, and you know I've been familiar with Samaritan's Purse, of course, as, as many have. And a lot of my connection to Samaritan's Purse has been through uh, Operation Christmas Child. Mm-hmm. Our church has participated in that, and I've been around that you know throughout my life. Mm. Um, but such, such a diverse ministry. Mm. I, I don't know another way to say that. There's so many components and so many parts, but there is a heart to the whole thing. It comes back to one thing. Um, from your perspective, what's the heart of Samaritan's Purse? What is the win yeah. for Samaritan's Purse? Well, the heart is the gospel. Yeah. And so the win, I think, is for me as I look at it, will be that Samaritan's Purse is a legacy. If it, if it died tomorrow and ended tomorrow that there'd be no doubt that Samaritan's Purse was a ministry about sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Now, Kenny Isaacs, who runs our projects department, international projects department, he'll always say, he will say, hey, the quality of our work is the platform of our witness. And because we believe in scripture, mm-hmm. we want to be known as good stewards of the resources entrusted to us, but that we do good work in the name of Jesus Christ. Right. We're not a charity. Mm-hmm. We're not a good works organization. We're an evangelistic association. So no different than my grandfather, the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, which my dad runs now. Yeah. The the ministry is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ there, and they do it in the stadiums of the world. They use the internet and technology. Well, the mission of Samaritan's Purse is no different. Um, but as in the name of Samaritan's Purse, it comes from the story of the Good Samaritan. And as we know, we meet the immediate needs of those in the ditch. First of all, we don't pass by anybody. We love everybody. Mm-hmm. The sinner. Yeah. That's who we're supposed to yeah. love. Um, and that's who we go to. We run to them, whether it's guns, the sound of war, or during famine, during natural disaster. We have resources to respond, and we go to that. But if you remember the story, he met the immediate needs. He, he bandaged. He gave water. He gave food. He gave transportation. And then he gave housing. Yeah. But then he told that innkeeper, here's some money. If that doesn't cover it, I'll be back and cover my debts. A debt was paid. The debt is the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the most important part of the story. So in all that we do, we share the gospel of Jesus Christ. So when my grandfather ministered to the thousands, we may only minister to ones and twos, but it's those individuals that got stuck in the ditch that couldn't make it to the stadium. Yeah. And so that's the mission of Samaritan's Purse. So what's the, what's the win? Uncompromising obedience to the gospel. Um, that's a, if that's the legacy of Samaritan's Purse, that's a win. Um, if it's ones and twosies, you know, sure. I'm fine with that. Sure. But we can't lose the trust of the widow or we lose her widow's might. Yeah. And that means she's entrusting us with every bit that she can. And it's not the expectation to do good works. It's the expectation that we share the gospel yeah. of Jesus Christ. If we don't share the gospel, that trust goes away. So, okay, someone listening might say, why is the gospel so important? Now, as a, as a, Christian that cares about the gospel, that lives hopefully to communicate the gospel. Um, it seems self-evident, but I think there are probably a lot of people that look at the work of an organization like Samaritan's Purse and say hospitals and and food mm-hmm. and gifts for children who would never get a gift. That's enough. Mm-hmm. Why does the gospel have to be a part of that? Yeah. Well, when someone's hungry, they're going to hunger again. Um, but we want them to know the one answer that solves their thirst and their hunger yeah. for life. Yeah. And there's a spiritual darkness in their in their hearts and their souls. And they're always going to ask, why are you here? Or they're going to ask, why has God forsaken me? And we want them to know that God hasn't forsaken them. Uh, that's why we respond to natural disasters here, hurricanes and tornadoes. It's why we respond to wars like in Ukraine, overseas, to the droughts and build and drill wells. Um, it is to respond with the gospel. So for your listeners that aren't listening, to make, you know, hey, well, isn't good works enough? And no, charity is not mm. enough. Yeah. Um, it does say in Scripture, go and love your neighbor, but they commanded us to go make disciples That's right. you know, of, of the world, of yeah, the nations. Right. 
And so that's the mission of Samaritan's Purse is to share the gospel, to make future disciples. We can always do more with more disciples. Um, and that's why we always work through a local church. Because, yeah. yes, we're in country offices. We're about 18 different countries with country offices. Um, and then we have Operation Christmas Child Network in 120 different countries. But Samaritan's Purse, if we go in somewhere, we work through the local church because mm. at some point we'll leave. Yeah. What does that local church look like? Are they more in place, more positioned to minister and disciple those new believers that came to Christ at a hospital? Because if we share Christ with them, they accept them, and then we leave, just like people here, you're going to go back to your same temptations, your same life. Yeah. They need to be discipled and loved on. That's where the church comes in. Uh, so, I mean, everything is about the gospel of yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah. The hope that I have inside me, I want the whole world to have. Yeah. Why would I hide the truth? Why would I hide the light and not share it with the world? And that's why God gives us these resources, is to share His truth. Yeah. When you talk about the widow's might, and, and I've heard you say that several times, and then talking with your staff over the last couple of days, they have said, as Edward says, it's the widow's <laughs> might. And, and so that, that is, you know, is a mantra, and it's an important mantra. Uh, what do you mean by that, and, and why do you focus so much on that? Well, in the story of Scripture where it talks about who gave most, you hear the rich men come in and they're dropping their loud coins and into the buckets, yeah. and then Jesus talks about the, the little old widow that came and gave the widow's might, which was a fraction of a penny. Yeah. And the lesson of that story is she gave all she could. She gave until it hurt. That's, she had no more money. She didn't have money to even pay her bills that night, but she trusted God would use that for His ministry. And so when... We get the $20 gifts. We don't work off grants necessarily here at Samaritan's Purse. Uh, we, we have received grants, but that's a very small uh, a very small fraction, right. you know, about 10% of what we take at Samaritan's Purse. I believe it, it's because God trusts us with the church. And if the church, the body of Christ, trusts us with their resources, the $15 gifts a month, yeah. because that's all she can give, She's expecting us to go and love the neighbor in the name of Jesus Christ and share the gospel. She also expects us to love them with quality work. Right. And if we say we're going to do something, that we do it. Um, and so that's why I tell people, if we lose her trust, yep. we're dead in the water. I'd rather be more interested in a bunch of widows supporting of our ministry yeah. than just a few rich men that are giving large sums of money. Um, because I, God can bless that. I'm not, and there's sure. some great rich people with great sure. resources. Um but the faith of the widow, yeah. that's what I want this ministry to be built on. Because if she's giving us $15 a month, she's praying over that. That's right. And I want her prayers more than I want her $15. I was just going to talk about faith and what what an example of faith that is. The entire work is a work of faith, right? right. And when you talk about the widow's might, she's giving that by faith, faith in, in the organization that she's giving it to, faith mm -hmm. in Samaritan's Purse, she's entrusting that to you, but faith in... God to be able to take what she can give mm -hmm. and expand it, and then Samaritan's Purse is able to communicate that by faith to people who just need that hope. And mm -hmm. it, 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 the whole thing is an act of faith or a work of faith mm -hmm. then. Well, we, we're not the church at Samaritan's Purse. Right. So I always tell me, like, tithe. Like, right. That's your first yeah, right. thing. Sure. Don't, Support you, your church. <laughs> we're not your tithe. Right. And it shouldn't be. I mean, that's to me, that's not that's not it. Um, that's and not all biblical. the pastors listening right now are, <laughs> yeah. are applauding. Yes, tie to your local church. <laughs> but we're we want to be an extension of the tool of the church. Yeah, uh, I've heard people talk about being like the work gloves of the church. You know, and so we have the resources to come in and help after a hurricane or tornado, like up in New York, where we are right now, outside the gates of West Point, Orange mm -hmm. County. We responded there with the flooding. We're in Tulsa. Um, we're in various parts. Of it. We've been in Arkansas for a while. We're still in Kentucky after the flooding and the tornadoes there. Um, we want the church to be able to come alongside us and minister to these people that are hurting. But it's that faith. It says serving in Jesus' name, like even on our cargo planes. Right. If you look at the emblem of Samaritan's Purse, it has the cross up there. We don't hide who we are and what we're about. Yeah. We're proud of the fact that we're a Christian organization committed yeah. to sharing the gospel. So that's part of that faith. I think when she gives, the widow gives, she knows we're not ashamed. That's good. And those are the kind of people that are partnering with Samaritan's Purse. That's awesome. Um, I'll end with this question again, a thousand other questions I could ask. Mm -hmm. But as I've, again, been here for a day and a half, really, not very long, but heard so many stories and, and talking to staff members, it's all about giving that hope. Mm -hmm. it, it's all about communicating hope and giving hope to those who would not receive it otherwise. For a person listening, whatever reason, whatever their life situation is, they are without hope. Mm -hmm. 
what would you say to that person? They're sitting on the other side of this table and they said, Edward, I, I'm just at a place in my life where I, I don't know what to do, where to turn. I, I am without hope. If huh. something doesn't change, I'm done. Huh. What do you say to that person? You know, with our ministry up in Alaska with Operation Hiller Patriots, I see this a lot. Yeah. And a lot of couples are getting off that plane and the divorce paperwork or I mean, the paperwork for the yeah. divorce is yeah. already filled out. Yeah. They come up there saying, this is it. If this doesn't work, we sign when we get back. They have lost complete hope mm. and, uh, and what they believe marriage is. And it's a man's view of marriage and understanding of marriage, and which is a false and broken right. view. Right. Um, my, what I always tell couples when they, sh- they show up, and this is what I would tell your listeners, it doesn't matter if you even had a relationship with Christ and you, you've... Because I've met Christians now that lack hope. You know, say they were born again Christians that lack hope, or you've never even heard the name of Jesus Christ. Surrender. Mm-hmm. And so, coming from a military, and I talked about this before in surrendering and what I had to do in my own life. Coming from a military culture, I don't care if you're Marine, yeah. Navy, Air yeah. Force, Army. Surrender is a dirty word. Right. We don't like right. it. We think we can be in control. And you and I were just talking about how we thought we were in control of the battlefield, yeah. and we're not. Right. Um. For these couples, what I ask them when they show up this week, surrender your hearts. Just say, Lord, I'm useless. I can't do this. Yeah. I am lost. Yeah. Be honest. I'm hopeless. Lord, I need yeah. you. I have to have you. And the thing about our faith and our walk with the Lord is we were never meant to be alone. Um, it even says in Scripture when he made man, he knew we weren't perfect. Yeah, it's not and good. so he, yeah. yeah, he made us a partner yeah. and a woman. And uh he gave us uh, a life partner, and I've got a beautiful wife, but that's not the relationship I'm even talking about. He knew we weren't alone and that he sent his son, Jesus right. Christ, to die on a cross. And if we make that decision and we surrender our lives, he's always been the Lord of our lives. He's always been the It doesn't matter if you reject him. He's still Lord and sovereign. The surrender part is, Lord, I acknowledge that you are my Lord and Savior, that you are in charge I've been wrong for rejecting that, and uh, you bend your knee to His will and planning your life, not your own. And that's the kind of surrender I'm talking about. That hope will come. That's good. Um, and so that's I had to do that in my own life when I made that faith my own yeah. when I was running. So that's why I say I was a believer, yeah. but I was running from the Lord. I wasn't living for the Lord. I had to surrender. That surrender is no different from that person that has never even made that initial connection with Christ to give that up. Surrender is a dirty word in our community. I mm. got it. Try it. Right. Just try it. Yeah. Yeah. Surrender to the Lord. Uh, it, it's amazing. We talk about victory. That's the other side of that, mm-hmm. right? Is that surrender in 1 Corinthians 15 it helps us to understand that the victory is available, but it requires surrender. Mm-hmm. Surrender to the one who has paid the price for that victory, mm-hmm. and we can have that in our lives. Man, I really appreciate it. Thanks for the conversation. Oh, man, this has been awesome. Thanks for the opportunity. But, you know, I thank you for your, your service, but the mm-hmm. ministry, especially what. Um, not only your podcast, but also with Mighty Oaks Foundation, what it's doing for those that are hurting that have no hope right. and pointing to Jesus Christ. Uh, I'm a huge fan, and let me know if we can ever do anything to support you all. Well, likewise, i um, super blessed just to be around you all. And, yeah. and you don't know what you don't know, but, but coming here over the last couple of days, we brought several of our staff members. Your staff has been so open, open hand. Mm-hmm. God bless us with the knowledge, the opportunity, the resources. We want to share that with you. And I'm very thankful that as a Christian community, we can work together. You know, God brings you the best people. I learned that from my dad that I'm not good at a lot of things. My my academic performance at West Point is make that very obvious. <laughs> Surround yourself with talent, and God has brought people. I say slumming for the ministry. They could be making a great a uh, great deal of fortune in man's eyes outside of here, but they're slumming for Jesus here. And uh, I love them. We got some great staff. They're a lot of fun. Well, doing incredible work. Thank you for what you're all doing. Thank you for your strong stand for you, you, your dad, of course, and uh, just a strong stand for the gospel. No. It's awesome. For those of you that are listening, again, if you haven't yet subscribed, do that. Um, take some time. Run over to lifeaudio.com. Life Audio. That's where this podcast is. Platform. Other great podcasts there. And uh, love to have you there. Thank you for listening. Talk to you next time. Many of our veterans feel they need to fight their battles alone. This self-isolation has led to the staggering statistic of more than 20 veterans taking their lives every day. The mission of Mighty Oaks is to eradicate the veteran suicide epidemic and help our warriors change their legacies. 
We've been able to help over 4,000 veterans and first responders by equipping them with the tools they need to live the lives they were created to live. Our faith-based, peer-to-peer approach has one of the highest success rates of any program available today, offering hope and understanding to those who need it most. By aligning their lives to biblical principles, these men and women are able to lead their families, their communities, and our nation. It's your generosity that can make a difference in the lives of the men and women who have fought for our country and our freedoms. Now that they're home, don't let them fight alone. Learn more at MightyOaksPrograms.org.